Welcome to the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. Reformation Fellowship provides support and fellowship for all who would stand for the Reformation of Christ Church worldwide. We long to see the church revitalized by the gospel and seek to encourage all who share that vision. We gather together for gospel-hearted fellowship around gospel-minded theology. Welcome to the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Schell. And in the season, we are covering past and present Reformation fellowships, you might say. Uh, when in the past and when today do we find gospel ministers coming together for encouragement, for fellowship, for relationship in such a way that it, it spills over into the Reformation of Christ's church and even out into mission? And on this episode, we're going to be talking with Matt Dye, lead pastor of M28 Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and Aaron Minikoff, senior pastor of Mount Vernon Baptist Church in Sandy Springs, Georgia. Uh, Matt and Aaron are both involved in the Greater Atlanta Baptist Network, and we're going to explore with them what God is doing today, how they are helping bring together like-minded, like-hearted gospel ministers, and how that is uh, impacting their churches and impacting the world around them. Let's dig in. Thank you, Aaron and Matt, for joining us here on the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. I'm so glad that you could be with us today. We're happy to be here. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if we could start this way. Could each of you maybe take a, a minute or two and just kind of say, here's who I am, what I'm up to these days, where the Lord has me, things like that. Yeah, uh, my name is Matt Dye, and I am the pastor of M28 Church in the heart of the city here in Atlanta, Georgia. We are just a, a month away from celebrating nine years. I moved here 10 years ago to plant uh, here in the city, and so by God's grace, we are about to be nine years old as a local fellowship, and uh, I get the joy of serving as uh, one of the elders and the primary preaching pastor, and it's been a great joy and just in a great season of growth and um, excitement among our church family, and it's just a delight. I'm married to my wife of over 28 years, Teresa. We have four children, two that are in college, a senior in college and a sophomore in college, and then we have two boys at home uh, still that are in high school, and so those things, you put that together, that's what I've been up to lately. <laughs> uh, yeah, busy. Yeah, that's wonderful. Aaron? Yeah, and I would say that if you're in Atlanta, you really do need to visit M28 Church. It's the type of congregation that really is settled in a community and where neighbors really are able to walk by the church, get to know the members of the church. There's a vibrant college ministry. It's not far from Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really thankful for, for M28 and for Matt's leadership there. I am Aaron Menikoff. I'm one of the pastors of Mount Vernon Baptist Church. Uh, we are uh, just north of the city of Atlanta. I became a Christian toward the uh, very, very end of my high school uh, time uh, back in the state of Oregon, uh, moved to D.C. to work in politics for a few years. And then uh, after desiring ministry and having that affirmed, I went off to seminary at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, always expecting that I'd go back to the secular Pacific Northwest, but instead wound up in Atlanta, where I've been since 2008, uh, and am thrilled to be here. Yeah. Wonderful. So glad both of you are here. And um, this season here on the Reformation Fellowship podcast, we are highlighting past and present examples of uh, fellowships and that could be um, formal, informal, but fellowships of, of different kinds that have helped uh, strengthen the pastor, strengthen the gospel worker, um, but also help to spur on, on mission together as they come together. So um, we are today talking about the Greater Atlanta Baptist Network, uh, of which you guys uh, are part and, and provide some leadership for. Could you help us understand what is what is that and uh, how did how and why did the network get started? Yeah, uh, we call it Gavin, 
uh, Gavin finds its genesis in a, a, a historic tradition among Baptists of having local associations. Mm. And so most uh, Baptist churches around the country in America here, uh, at least if they're, especially if they're involved with the Southern Baptist Convention, um, are part of a local Baptist association that may itself be part of a Georgia Baptist, uh, excuse me, a state convention. In our state, it's the Georgia Baptist Convention. But what we've seen over the past few years is uh, those uh, affiliations between national and state and local, they've, they've often deteriorated a bit. In addition, if, if the, the last thing or the first thing to go has really been the local association. Mm. And so when, when, when we got to Atlanta, our Baptist Association uh, you know, had a small budget, a, a full-time employee called a, a director of missions or an associational missionary. And um, it was just going through a lot, of, uh, a lot of pains. And so we basically took what we inherited, this sort of traditional uh, association of Baptist churches, and we tried to ask the question, if we were going to start from scratch, what would we build? And because uh, our association, you know, is relatively small, and because we are relatively close to one another, we were able to have conversations to sort of recreate this association in a mold that, that we think is actually more historically Baptist in both its theology and its function. And so now the Greater Atlanta Baptist Network basically focuses on, on four things. We, we pool our resources to fund Great Commission work in our city. Uh, we meet together annually to do the quote-unquote business of the, the network, raising up leaders, identifying leaders, uh, voting on a budget. We, we seek to meet once a year for a pastor's retreat but to your point, really the bread and butter of the network is a monthly pastor's fellowship where uh, pastoral staff from the region come together to discuss significant theological and ministerial issues, to break bread, not the Lord's Supper, but to have lunch together and to pray for one another. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Could you talk a little bit more about... Um, let's say a church or, or a pastor shows up uh, or, or calls, emails, says, hey, we really align with, with what you guys are, are, are doing theologically, philosophically, and they, they join. What's, it, what's their experience going to be as they kind of take their first steps into that network? Yeah, th that piece of it is just so vital to me because to go back to when I moved here 10 years ago, um, when I came, and I, as Aaron was saying, like in our in our baptistic structures, I honestly I didn't want to join a network because of where I had pastored previously for almost ten years. In the kind of health of that association or that network was just one of great just heartache for me, and I tried to bring change, and there was just very few guys that I felt like we were as like minded as I would want to just really lock arms with. And I mean, I love some of those brothers, you know, not trying to cast stones, but I just came kind of going, okay, I don't see a value in this. And then as I was looking at the landscape here and I got introduced to the Greater Atlanta Baptist Network, um, when I was told what that looked like for a pastor, I went, I don't know if that really can be true or not, um, but it is. And that's why I've been so involved and has been such encouragement because you know, what it looks like for the pastor is we're not trying to create a bunch of programs and processes to kind of run your local congregation. Our ecclesiology just demands of us that that happens among the local church. And those things that Aaron mentioned that we just really try to stay like, these are the lanes that we're trying to stay in. And the primary one is that monthly pastor's fellowship to where a term I use among my church family all the time uh, among our covenant members is I see this as another extension of my soul being cared for. And that's what I love. These brothers have become dear to me. Yeah. Uh, they understand there is a, a help to have some folks that kind of understand what it is to pastor and to, to, to be a shepherd of a local congregation. 
Um, the books that we read together, we're not looking for just pick me up books. We're, we're trying to read books together that challenge us. We study scripture together. We pray for one another. And that's when somebody comes to us and says, I'm kind of trying to get the landscape of the Greater Atlanta Baptist Network. Those are the things that I highlight and say, brother, you need this for your soul. Mm -hmm. You need this for the sake of your soul so that you can endure and persevere and uh, be found faithful at the end of your ministry. That's wonderful. Can I ask, um, so there's the, that monthly fellowship, does that usually end up kind of spilling over outside of that couple of hours together as well? Yeah, I mean, just uh, just today I had lunch with a brother who pastors uh, not too far from Matt. Um, it's going to look like, uh, you know, the occasional text. Uh, uh, some of these guys play golf together. Um, but I would just say, you know, even if it was just that couple of hours, I mean, uh, a pastor's schedule, I don't care the size of your church. It's, it's just demanding. And yeah. um, those two hours, even if that's all it is, are, are life-giving. You know, it's not a requirement. I mean, I have sweet fellowship with the elders of the church that I serve here. I mean, I love these guys and they're my closest brothers. Um, I, I get fellowship from my local church, but there is something, uh, there's something sweet and unusually edifying by being able to hear what's going on at M28, you know, or at Gospel Hope or at, uh, uh, you know, at First Baptist Chattahoochee. So, you know, mm -hmm. two hours every month, that's not a small commitment, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it has been encouraging to see uh, brothers getting together outside of those times. Yeah, that's I would add to that. Um, yeah, tomorrow morning, actually, I'm having coffee with uh, another brother who's in our network. They're a newer church. So we've been able to form a really nice relationship of just encouraging one another and uh, him asking me questions about what I've learned in my 10 years of planting, where he's just uh, about 18 months in now that they've, you know, the church has begun. So that's encouraging. I want to add to that. Um, like for my family personally, um, just in some personal areas, we've had some difficulties over the last kind of 12 to 18 months. And just not that long ago, um, one of the other brothers uh, in our network, his wife came and just sat on the front porch with my wife for about an hour, an hour and a half. They lived close to us. And just ministered to my wife and just, uh, you know, cared for her soul in that sense. It was very encouraging. And uh, same thing. I, I am stunned. One thing that Aaron does so well, um, I will meet folks out occasionally, or if I'm special, like I said, we're very close to Georgia Tech. We have a lot of college students. And if somebody says, you know, well, I've been attending at Mount Vernon Baptist Church. And I was, of course, say, man, that's fantastic. What a wonderful church. I know Aaron very well. And when I introduce myself, he'll say, oh, M they'll say M28 Church. Oh, well, we, we've prayed for you on a Sunday morning. We pray for M28 Church. Mm -hmm. And so even, you know, Mount Vernon and our, our network of encouraging. And so we, Aaron was a big encouragement too when I first heard that. And now we have begun to do that over time as well on a Sunday morning of praying for our network and what God is doing through this collection of churches that are, are partnering together this way. So, hey, Matt, can you, um, can you remember the books we've read the last few years? Yes. Well, I, we, you know, we have read Delighting in the Trinity. We've read by, Delighting in the Trinity. Which was fantastic. Um, Big fans of, of that one here. Yeah. On the yeah. Reformation Fellowship podcast. Yes, absolutely. Very helpful book. Um, and it was very uh, helpful for us. Uh, what was the, the book about shepherding, Aaron? What was the so title? We read that, that is it Harold Sank bio? Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. The Lutheran yeah. pastor. That's right. Uh, the book on shepherding of souls. Um, mm. we, we found the way he wrote strange because there's just some different doctrine. Uh, mm. But at the yeah. heart of it, just so helpful. Was mm. I remember we did um, we did Michael Lawrence's book on conversion. Yes, uh, that yeah. was really great. Mark series. Yeah. Yeah. Good and book. now we're and we're launching in right now into Spurgeon the pastor. Yeah, Jeff Chang. I just yeah. received my copy. And um, is it is it Van Doren who wrote the book on on uh, Sole Deo Gloria? We did That's that right. a couple of years ago. That's right. Yes. But mm. you know the thing, um, Justin. It's interesting. I went to I was in Chicago. I guess a couple of years ago now, and they've got a great pastors fellowship there. 
and they were we were talking about it and uh they said that like for every monthly meeting they've got like a, a, an entire book that they're discussing so over the course of like a year they're reading like 10 books and i oh. just think that's great we totally don't do that we take one <laughs> book that's right over 10 months uh -huh. and uh you know we're just using it as a platform mm. to grow together and and, and talk mm -hmm. um so i that's not a model it's just it's worked for us mm -hmm. um it's pretty low commitment like our ministries are pretty high commitment we keep it pretty low commitment but i think the conversations are are always good and encouraging mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. well we try to bring in during that time as well we don't do just discussing the book if there's a brother that's working through something in their own church that we feel like would be helpful for everyone, Aaron does a great job typically of saying like, hey, could we do, you know, some time on that just to kind of interview you or talk about it, share your experience, get some insight. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done that. Pressing issues of the cultural day that just, yeah. you know, are bearing down on our local churches and people, uh, our, our church families are asking about it. We, we want to try to take some time when appropriate to kind of process that a little bit and how are, how are, how are y'all handling this? That was a lifeline in 2020, Matt, because I remember we met at your church and we talked about uh, COVID and th we talked, this was outside of quarantine. Um, and we talked about how our churches were discussing or not discussing issues of race. Yeah. And um, that was really helpful because not everybody was in the exact same place but we had such a history of of love and trust mm. that we were able to articulate where we were how we were striving to lead our churches in this area and i think the conversation probably um you know influenced all of us you know a, a little bit i remember years ago when we were just starting when it had just become gabin we invited al moeller to come and give the address at our annual meeting. Do you remember that, Matt? That was my very first one. And uh, so it was late one night and uh, I remember he made fun of our name. Apparently there's a there's a snake called the Gaboon Viper. <laughs> and so he, of course he drew attention to the fact that our name uh, sounds a lot like a venomous snake. Yeah, um, but I remember that, he, you know, he, we asked him to speak about the importance of associationalism which in one sense was a talk about denominationalism in general. And I'll never forget, he said, um, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, we partner together is so that we don't become weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just so that you're, you're around some other brothers who are theologically in the same camp. So I do think it gets a little bit more difficult if you're not, if you're seeing a lot of basic things differently, it gets mm -hmm. a little bit hard in that area. But just to be around people who just who can say, you know, Aaron, I hear what you're saying or doing. You just need to know I've never heard anyone say or do that. I've never read that. That seems a little odd to me. Mm. You know, can we go to the Bible and 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 see is that wise? Yeah. And um, usually that's not an issue, right? But in in years like you know a, a global pandemic, that was really helpful. Yeah. Friends, we want to take just a moment out of our conversation to tell you about the upcoming Reformation Fellowship Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, November 11th through 12th. Our theme, the theme that we will gather around is the gospel, our hope, our banner. We want to come together, celebrate the gospel, unite around the gospel and be encouraged in the gospel. You will hear plenary addresses from Michael Reeves, Dane Ortland. Phil Riken, Jeff Norris. You will also select a track to participate in at the conference. There's a track for any Christian who just wants to go deeper in their faith. There's a track for pastors, a track for women, and a track for theologians and scholars. And the hope for these tracks is to grow you, to develop you wherever you're at, in whatever way you're serving the church but also to encourage you by connecting you with others in a similar place. Those tracks are each led by wonderful theologian leaders, and we're, we just know that you're going to be encouraged. So that is November 11th and 12th.
12th in Atlanta, Georgia, hosted by Perimeter Church. It will be the first Reformation Fellowship Conference in the U.S. We will gather around the gospel, our hope, our banner. Everything you need to know, you can find at reffellowship.org. That's R-E-F fellowship.org. We hope to see you there. I can imagine. You, you mentioned, um, Aaron, the, the time commitment, and you're doing two hours roughly once a month. Um, I could imagine someone maybe listening to this podcast and think, I want to try to pull guys together in my city, but man, can I ask them to get together monthly? Um, can I ask them to give up a couple of hours a month? How, how might you guys um, speak into that, respond to that? that sort of a question. Yeah, I think, again, for us, as where I was coming again, like I said earlier, where I was hesitant to to jump into an association, I think those things happen well when with what you're putting together ends up being worth your time. It's worth the drive across the city. It's worth because we rotate it between church families and whoever's hosting it for that month. They provide the lunch. And so one or two times out of the year at the most, one time, you know, two at the most, I mean, you don't have to drive. The other times you're driving and we live in Atlanta and anybody knows anything about Atlanta, we have a little bit of a traffic issue occasionally. And so, you know, there is more of a commitment to it than even just the time that you're there. But sure. again, if I sit with maybe someone that is checking out our network here in the city, I tell them, I say, I promise you, if you come, you're going to find that it's worth your time. You're going to find that it's valuable um, that you're, again, I'm going to go back to the phrase you used earlier, your soul is going to be cared for. And so I put them on my calendar clearly. And then I just, I do everything I can to protect that time. And I think that's done by not just getting together and giving a platform for people to complain. You know, if, if all this is, is just to kind of air your frustrations in ministry. Mm. I, I mean, I don't even see that as a faithful response of gathering together, um, but having a time to connect with people, really get to know one another, eating a meal together for us, I just seem is valuable in that. But then not leaving it at that also, having some real directive uh, conversations, questions. And because like Aaron said, we at least are enough like-minded theologically and those, the foundation is, is close enough in what we would all agree in, in our convictions it has just over time, as you get to know these brothers, you can trust them. And it has led to just extremely helpful conversation for mm. me as a dad and a husband, as a pastor, as a citizen. I mean, in all the hats and roles that we end up wearing, I just cannot stress enough how valuable it has been for me personally. And I would say the 35 to 40 guys that are very committed that we see just month in and month out that come to our retreat I mean, it ebbs and flows a little bit, but those, that core group, I think they would be saying the same thing I'm saying over and over. Mm. Yeah, I would, um, I would agree with everything that, that Matt said. And I, I want to distinguish, you know, a, a pastor's fellowship from a church gathering. Just let me just start with an obvious thing. Like we, we, we have to gather as a church. Mm. It, it is sinful not to, you know, the Bible you know, both implicitly makes the case that we're to gather together, but then you've got, you know, you shall not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Yeah. So I, when I, when I'm thinking about, you know, bringing the members of Mount Vernon together, I, I do want them to want to come, but at one level, I'm simply telling them, this is what the Bible says. Like you may not feel like it, but you need to come because King Jesus says, gather. Right. Uh, we, I, I can't draw the same theological, um, you know, conclusion from the Bible. But having said that, I don't think the Bible is silent on the issue of uh, ecclesiastical fraternity. So, for mm -hmm. example, you know, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote, when he sent Tychicus to the Ephesians, you know, he did so that they might know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Paul, now I know Paul is an apostle, obviously, and I, no apostles today, but Paul very much des desired that local church to be encouraged by news of another church. Hmm. Um, you know, similarly, when uh, Paul is ending most all of his New Testament epistles, <clears throat> he's, he's sending greetings from one church or another. Hmm. 
the, the, the texture of the New Testament seems to be one of church fraternity. Yeah. And um, so when I'm maybe a little bit tired or thinking, you know, here, you know, here we've got the next fellowship, I'm reminded of how, how, how this is part of basic Christianity in my mind. Yeah. Doesn't mean I have to go to a meeting the same way I have to go to church. But it does mean that it's, I don't think it's a thing indifferent. Um, the type of community that we're seeking to engender in, in Atlanta. Now, having said all that, I totally agree with Matt. Like, we want it to be something that people want to come to, you know, and I think that's really important. Um, not assume people's presence yeah. uh, or not to assume people's interest. And um, I mean, that takes work. And so I think we're constantly talking what can we tweak? What can we do better? Um, is where are we? We want to do something people are, are willing to drive to. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm listening, maybe that, that last question I, I asked, how can I ask this of, of people? Maybe I feel good about what I've heard from you guys. No, it, it, it can be worth it. Um, I wonder if my, maybe my next concern would be, but how, how do I make it worth it? <laughs> Um, you've mentioned a couple of things, Matt, you said it, it shouldn't be a, a time to just come and let's complain to each other and, and gripe about our, 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 you know, our staff or our people or, or politics. Um, you guys have mentioned some of the things you do together, read a little bit, discuss. Um, how would you, let's say someone is starting a fellowship and they're trying to think of, well, really probably they're trying to th- figure out how not to overthink it. What, what would it look like for me to, to gather these, these brothers and, uh, and set the table for the Lord to be able to, to do a work in us, but me to not get in the way of that either. How would yeah. you, how would you speak into that? Well, let me share a few things. And Matt, I'd love to hear what, what I'm missing here. And um, Justin, I feel a little bit like I'm walking out on a limb here. Cause I just, I don't have a Bible verse for this. So this is just a little bit of prudence, a little bit of prudence. And I think it really could differ, you know, place to place, even man to man. But let me share these things that that, that I think we found helpful. Um, One would be to alternate the locations of it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, Atlanta is a big city. If it's always at Mount Vernon, Matt Baptist Church, where I serve, we're actually pretty conveniently located. But we're not. It's super convenient for me because I'm here, um, but there, there is some value in, in encouraging the brothers to see and be at other churches. So mm. alternate the location. Uh, also, avoid commercials. In other words, it's amazing how many people have reached out and said, hey, could I have five minutes to talk about this? Or could I have five minutes to talk about this? And my answer is basically no. Like mm. pastors are always being emailed. They, you know, people want, you know, want time in front of the church. Uh, this is not a time for commercials. You know, mm. uh, those, those ministries can, 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 uh, can reach out and have a private lunch if they want. Um, so I think that's helpful. Uh, really respecting brother's time. I mean, this may be an American culture thing. So, you know, this may not work overseas, but, for our culture, for these guys to know, hey, at two o'clock, we're going to be done. Mm. And you can bank on it. It just, they know that they're not going to have to wonder, is this thing going to drag to 2.30? No, we really try to respect, we try to respect uh, people's time uh, pretty, pretty uh, significantly. And then lastly, provide a little bit of um, programming diversity. In Mm. other words, you know, one, you know, meeting, we may devote the time to everyone giving an update. How are you doing spiritually? How's your church doing? And then we may pray for that. And lo and behold, we don't have any time for the book discussion. Mm-hmm. You know, another meeting, there may be really no time for personal check-in, but at that meeting, maybe, um, or no group check-in, but at that meeting at a table, guys mm-hmm. might spend 15 minutes praying for one another. Yeah. Uh, at another meeting, we may devote the whole time to a um, an urgent matter related mm. to a cultural moment. And I think that by, by, by keeping things a little bit different, uh, I think guys know 
this is not a boilerplate a boilerplate event. Uh, those are some things that I think that have made it uh, made it helpful. Matt, what would you add? Yeah, I don't know that I have a whole lot to add to that. I think your point that again that I found so refreshing is, I would agree you don't we don't want to overthink it, but when we do think about what we want to do, I, I just am so thankful that we're not trying to do everything. We're really trying to say here's a few things that we want to do, and we just want to do them the best that we can when we're together for what we're gathering in that sense. And I've just found that to be just refreshing, refreshing, well done. I feel like weight is off of us that get to serve in some of the leadership positions in my time of getting to do that. I've been on both sides of just, you know, attending and getting to put a little leadership into it. And that weight just kind of is gone. We're not, we're not sitting like, what's the next thing we got to figure out to try to refresh it. We kind of, this is what we do. We want to do it really well. And I also think that piece about not having commercials is so helpful because I, I do get bombarded at times and have to tell folks like, you know, hey, I can maybe put it into an email and I send that out once a month um, if we feel like it's, you know, we want to do that, especially among the churches in the network. So I think that's another thing to tie this conversation together. If Aaron is having something just great at his church that he's kind of opening up outside of his church family. And yeah. we want to put that into a, our monthly email that says this, you know, two day conference is going to be happening or this training is going to be happening. And here's the information. And that's kind of what we let that land. Um, and folks can decide if they want to be a part of that or not be a part of it. Um, but yeah. I think that just here's our lane. We're staying in it is very helpful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I would add that we are not trying to, I mean, we certainly want to grow to the extent that we want God to plant churches in our region. And we want to see maybe dead and dying churches revitalized and brought back to health. So in that mm -hmm. sense, we'd love to grow. Mm -hmm. But in another sense, we kind of don't care how many people come. Yeah, You know, we're not, we're not like begging guys to, hey, join Gabin so that you can start committing financially. Like okay. it's, we want, we just, we're doing it. We're trying to be faithful. We think this is great. And this mm -hmm. isn't like some like passive aggressive soft sell. Yeah. I mean, we're genuinely just here to try and, and uh, encourage one another in the faith, make sure our churches know one another as well as, as they can. And, uh, you know, other churches are kind of welcome to listen in on that. And so I think guys might, they, they, they come and they know they're not going to be pressured to join or pressured to give. It's just, it's not that, it's not that space. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, even in, in the history of Baptist associations in America, if you go look back at the founding of the Philadelphia Association, it, way back, uh, I want to say it started in 1707. Uh, they didn't begin by sharing any resources. They just mm -hmm. began to encourage one another. You know, and then over time, someone had this idea, hey, what if we started a school, you know, mm -hmm. and they started a school and, you know, and, and over time, but I think somewhere along the road, though, it's like the, the tail began to wag the dog and all of mm -hmm. a sudden it became all about sharing resources. Yeah, I think sharing resources is great and I love it. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just say it's not it's not foundational to what we do. Mm. It is a wonderful byproduct mm. of what we do. And One it really matters. From the resource perspective that I also really am so thankful for. Um, and again, this is not casting stones at any other network or any other association, but our network right now is completely volunteer led by you know pastors. We don't receive anything. And then we all do it through our own building. So there's not a, a facility that we're paying for. So that frees up the money that comes to go to these areas of planting, revitalizing churches uh, mm -hmm. in our area that are connected to us. And then because we've been able over some years, have some even additional financial resources, being able to support some brothers that have been sent out internationally from our churches. So what I love about it as a local church pastor, part of the network is I do, I've led my church to give into our network. And so we give from our budget to the Greater Atlanta Baptist Network. But then under our missions giving, I should have looked this up, but I know of at least three that come to the top of my mind. We give individually to three other areas of ministry that I only know about and fully trust because of my involvement with Greater Atlanta Baptist Network. So mm. these opportunities happen all of a sudden, like, that's a good work. 
and that's a good brother. We mm-hmm. want to be behind it. And so then we come alongside and we put them into our budget and prayer time. And they're a part of now the larger great commission ministry of M28 church. And I can go, man, I've, as I lead my church, I'm like, these, this is a good work. I've went, worked alongside of them for years now. I've sat across the table and discussed the word and prayed with them and heard know about their family. And just, again, just gives me a great confidence in my own leadership in that sense to my local church. Mm, wonderful. Well, maybe we can, um, as we get here t- towards the end of our time, I'd love to hear just a little more. What you guys are hitting on here is the that missional partnership that sprung out of the fellowship. I wonder if you could share just a few minutes about and take it whatever direction you want. It could be stories of how oh, these churches have really worked together to see this this work done, or, or it could be on, here's kind of the, the policies of the network and, and why they're that way and, and how they've been beneficial. How mm-hmm. would you, uh, again, just help us understand some of what God's doing on that partnership yeah. missional side? Well, we've got a couple of policies that are... Um... I don't know exactly how they're written down, but but one of them is we really don't want to sit on money. Um, and so, you know, if we're having a dearth of applications and the uh, we've got a certain formula, but when that bank account gets too high, if it does, maybe there's a surplus, um, we're striving to give that money away. Um, so that's one that's one policy that forces us to keep our eyes open to works that deserve funding. Mm. And I think it, it's happened that sometimes uh, works that deserve funding don't, uh, don't always have individuals asking for that money. So we need to be around one another. We need to know what's going on in one another's lives and churches so that sometimes we can offer that money. The second maybe principle or policy is that we really do, we, we can't replace sort of a large denomination that might fully fund someone for a long period of time. We can't do that. But as much as possible, we strive to give large grants over extended periods of time Mm. so that, and this is not always the case, but so that typically every year we've got maybe two to three church plants or revitalization works that we're funding uh, significantly that, you know, Lord willing, we'll be able to fund the next year, the year after that for about three years. Mm. So whether that's, uh, you know, a number of years ago, there was a, a church about, you know, 45 minutes uh, west of the city that uh, Gavin became a, a supporter of that, of that work. And that, that church is thriving. I mean, praise God. Um, there's a, a church in, uh, in Athens. This is really is greater Atlanta. Athens is, is about an hour and 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. But there was a, a brother, it's a good work. Uh, they didn't have a building. And uh, Gavin has been able to contribute towards the purchase of land Mm -hmm. so that that church would be able to build a building, which is, you know, really great. There's a church in the inner city that has been seeking to raise up pastors. And so we funded an internship program uh, for three years. Not not the whole thing, but I I think we were able to fund fund that pretty significantly. I mean, every year there's stories like there's stories like that that we've been able to do because we've pulled our resources. Yeah. And recently too, I mean, just to add to the stories that just thrill my soul. And when we, you know, we're about to have actually our annual meeting. And when I gave the report last year of here's where, you know, for those that aren't closely involved, I want to give a quick summary and say, here's where the money has gone. And we also have been able to help push brothers out of our churches and our network that are being led to go serve on the international field, we've been able to give a significant chunk of money that has gotten them across the finish line to go get them on the field internationally. And I mean, it was just one of the, such a joy of, of my life one day after we had met and um, we had the resources available. And we honestly, at that point, didn't have any other applications that we needed to work through. And we said, this is a good brother that's doing a good work. Uh, with a good church in our network that has prepared them. He's been here training. He's ready. He's, he's being equipped. He's going to be sent out. And when I yeah. called him to tell him uh, the money that we were going to give so that he could get to the field, I mean, to be honest, he just started crying on the phone with me. 
And I was like, you know, Lord, thank you so much to have a little part of what you're doing uh, in the lives of these folks. And all that really is just born in my mind out of this continual once a month and then an annual retreat of just doing life together. We have a family in our church, a couple that are full time in South America, and they aren't through a funding structure. They're self-funded, have a sending agency, of course, but they have to raise their own finances. And they're actually home right now. Uh, doing what they have to do to meet with churches that are partnering with them, try to get more partnerships. And I was able to set them up with a meeting with uh, uh, a fellow pastor in our network. And we had a great meeting and I'm hoping that that's going to come on board for them to kind of pastor or I'm sorry, to uh, partner in that way as well. And there's again, a confidence that comes because you go, all right, this is coming out of one of our churches. I know where they stand. I know their convictions. And that just really helps that kind of vetting process uh, when you want to commit, uh, resources that way. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, gentlemen, thank you guys, Aaron and Matt for making some time for us here on the Reformation Fellowship podcast. Uh, I know I've been encouraged just to, to hear a little bit about what God is doing in and through the network there and, uh, some lessons that I, I hope to apply here in the Tulsa area. Uh, but again, just thanks for, for making some time and for fellowshipping with us. You're so welcome. Appreciate your work. Yeah, thank you. You've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. We pray that this time together has been a blessing to you. The Reformation Fellowship is a ministry of union. And so all that we do, we hope it helps you to delight in God, grow in Christ, serve the church, and bless the world. If that is your hope, that is your desire, then friends, welcome to the fellowship.